Hello, this is Mike again from Scratch, and today I'm going to be talking about buying laptops for game development. Basically, every two years I need to replace my current laptop, more or less, uh, like clockwork actually, and each time I do a ton of research and I compiled a guide basically um, putting together the, the reasoning behind my decision, and that's what we are talking about here today. So if you're in the market for a laptop for game development, hopefully this video will be of use for you. Now this is actually based off of a guide I've already published up on Game From Scratch, available here. I will link this down below. Uh, basically we walk through um, all the components that go together to make a laptop, and then I give several recommendations, which we will go through today. Um, now I don't have hands-on experience with every laptop in the list, so I can't talk towards build quality, support, etc. Uh, but in terms of feature specs, mobility, etc., they all fit the criteria. Basically, these were all laptops I personally considered purchasing myself. Now, I do have some criteria that you may not. And the other thing is, well, what exactly do you need for game development? And that really depends on what you are personally doing. If you're doing high resolution 3D modeling, for example, or you're doing lots of um, C++ code compilation, then certain things are gonna be more important to you. But but as a general rule, I would say you need to have a certain set of hardware. More or less, what I would say you need to have is basically the um, ability to run the game that you're targeting, plus about 50%, 25 to 50%. That's pretty much the overhead for the development tools required to make said game. And today I'm going to be looking at, you know, the kind of the trade-offs that you go to pick. You can never have perfection when it comes to laptops. There's always um, size versus um, performance versus cost, and you kind of got to balance between those. Now what I'm going to be looking at specifically today is portable laptops 15 inches and under um, that have a uh, weight of say five pounds, say at the most six pounds and under. Now there are a ton of laptops capable of game development that are 17 inches, seven plus pounds. Um, basically all you really need is a gaming capable laptop. So if portability is not a big deal to you, you have a world more options than what we're gonna look at in this list. Now before we get too far, and let's actually look at some of the key components in a laptop, um, and then we'll go from there. Now, um, what you probably want to talk about first is GPU. This is probably the most important requirement in a laptop uh, for modern game development is you're going to want a dedicated GPU. Now in this day and age, and I go into more detail in the article, so again, go to the article if you need more detail. But in this day and age, the 10 series GPU line, the 1050 is probably where I would cut off, maybe even the 1060. And a lot of that comes down to one, well, two words technically, virtual reality. If you're interested in doing VR development, you're gonna want about a 1060 as your baseline minimum. Now, a lot of laptops out there are available which straight out um, in integrated uh, graphics processor or something like um, an Intel HD 620, for example. And these will, for example, run some modern games, low to medium settings, for example, and you can easily create that caliber of game using these tools. But for, you know, more cutting edge games, the kind of stuff that you're creating using um, Unreal Engine, or if you want to run uh, 3D Studios Max or Maya or high definition scenes in Blender, you're going to probably want a better GPU and specifically if you want to run on the uh, ACC Vive or on the um, Oculus Rift, well, you basically straight up need a 970M or a 1060 or better. Now those numbers might be a little confusing and let me just break down specifically how NVIDIA does their numbering. First off, the nine or the 10 refer to the series. Basically right now, as of recording this, the 10 series is the most current, nine series being the previous series, the eight series being the, the silicon before that, etc. Now it isn't necessarily, um, it's not always a huge jump between the generations, but this year it actually was. So right now a 1060 is about performance equivalent to a 970 from last generation. So they jumped up a level. And then you can see the other important part of that numbering scheme. So the first part is your series. So basically first gen, second gen, third gen. So we're up to 10th gen. The second is your relative power. So you've got you know 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80. And you can basically think of each one being you know, 25 to 50% more powerful than the one before it. Um, that's kind of what you gotta be aware of. Now, there's also AMD out there and they make um, Radeon Vega, um, but 
until basically CES, which just happened, there were really no Radeon powered um, laptops available and there are none on my list today. However, this is something that is going to be changing because whoever thought this was gonna happen, there's an unholy reunion between um, Intel and AMD where Intel is now shipping Radeon powered laptops in a small form factor. So those could suddenly become very important in the near future. And apparently the new Radeon chip is about equivalent to an NVIDIA 1060. 60 mobile chip, which is actually quite impressive, and and as a result, fully VR capable, which is quite cool. Um, so obviously, GPU is going to be probably it's going to be the thing that separates out the, the available laptops too. You're going to find a lot of times a lot of laptops simply don't have a dedicated GPU, and that will probably be a deal breaker too. Next, we get into the CPUs, and the CPUs. Um, the CPUs are probably by far and away the most confusing. The amount of variation between your various different CPU generations and classes, etc., gets quite confusing. Really, all you got to think about is i5, i7. Either of those generally is good enough. And next, you get into generations of those as well. And we're currently up to the eighth generation of them. And truth be told, Intel has been kind of sleepwalking for a while now. There isn't a whole lot of difference between 5th gen, 6th gen, 7th gen, uh, also known as, oh God, I'm going to screw this up. There's Broadwell, Cabby Lake, Coffee Lake, etc. They've all got code names as well. But what you do probably want to be aware of is 7th gen versus 8th gen. There's been a big change there. And depending on what you're looking for, you're going to probably either want a 7th gen or an 8th gen. Now, generally, you're going to find if it's um, an i7-770, which is probably one of the most common CPU combinations out there on performance laptops, that's going to be more than enough for you. But if you really favor battery life, the new 8th gen chips, um, what they've done is they the amount of wattage required to, to actually run these chips is about a third of what the previous generation was. And this basically results in better battery life. Now, the flip side is it also results in slightly worse performance, but they've made up for that by um, turbocharging the heck out of them. So they, for day to day, they're going to be as fast and for the most part, as the previous generation's fastest chips, but they're doing it via a turbo. If you know anything about cars, it's kind of like comparing a turbocharger to a supercharger. A supercharger is always capable of speed, but it drains more fuel. A turbocharger is capable of keeping up with the supercharged car in bursts. Now, where are you going to find the difference between the 7th gen and where the 7th gen can be slightly better than the 8th gen is when you're doing things flat out, rendering... Um, uh, let's see, video encoding, um, not really compilation, that wouldn't really tax a CPU that much, but when you're doing things that max out a CPU to 100%, eventually a faster raw chip will outperform the newest generation stuff, but those are pretty much edge use cases. So for the most part, an eighth gen Intel i7 or i5 is good enough for you. Otherwise, all you're really looking at is clock rate, which is basically the way that we used to measure speed, and the number of cores slash threads. Now, in this day and age, especially for future proofing, you're gonna probably want at least and most offer four cores so go the four core route if you can um, and you'll probably be happy from that point on um, next up we get into displays now this is where really a lot of it comes down to opinion um, the two most common you're gonna find right now are 4k which is 3840 by 2160 I believe or full HD. Now the problem with 4K, at least in the Windows world, is sometimes DPI scaling isn't done well. And you're gonna run into some older legacy apps that really don't look great on 4K. Um, but the things that do look great look really good. Now I'm actually converted. I am very much a fan of 4K displays. Now, once you get used to it, the, the lack of eye strain and those kind of things really make it worthwhile. But there are a lot of reasons to go with a full HD, also known as a 1080p display. Um, so that decision really is gonna come down to you. Now, the nice thing about the 1080p displays, you don't run into those you know, bad scaling things because there's not that many pixels to scale. Um, it takes less uh, GPU power to actually make that screen work because uh, you know, you've got one quarter of the pixels to actually draw. Um, and it actually, as a result, takes up less battery power. So which one you prefer really comes down to you. Now, another thing to keep in mind out there is if you get a real baller machine, you're gonna probably wanna have it with something called G-Sync or uh, a higher uh, hertz rate. So most monitors out there are gonna be 60 hertz. And if you've got a game that you're playing at 120 hertz, well, that's not a lot of use if it's not drawing at that rate. So look for 120 hertz or G-Sync if that's really your thing, but those are both pretty premium features and I personally don't care if they exist but then again I'm not a die-hard first-person shooter type gamer that might be more important to you um, next up we've got solid state drives now if I can give you one piece of opinion that is the strongest thing I can say 
get a solid state drive. Like get as many solid state drives as you can, in fact. This is one of those areas that makes the biggest difference. If you get a solid state drive in a machine, it boots in eight seconds, six seconds. If you don't, if you have an old fashioned SATA drive at 7200 or even worse, 5400 RPM, your boot process is gonna be several times longer than that. And then on top of that, what you've often seen manufacturers do, in fact, the last laptop I bought, a Gigabyte G34PW, had um, 128 or 256 gigabyte SATA drive, or sorry, SSD drive for your system volume, and then a terabyte of 5400 RPM for storage and applications. Don't get this, it sucks. What I found is basically once applications started loading that, for example, I loaded up Visual Studio from my storage drive, I started seeing stuttering and slowing down and performance issues, etc. It's spend the money on SSD. Really, for game development stuff, especially things like code compilation, you're not going to see a bigger increase for bang for the buck than anything else other than solid state drives. Now, on the bright side, changing on a solid state drive in a laptop in this day and age is actually quite simple. Normally, it's three or four axis screws, pop in, pop out. But this is where you want to spend the money. Now, another area that's kind of getting more confusing and more important is ports. Now, the legacy USB port is starting to go away. In fact, a lot of the brand new machines you'll buy, stuff that just came to market, may not actually have an old school USB 1 or USB 2 port. So if you're the type of guy that hates dongles, keep that in mind. Another thing that you might find is actually an HDMI uh, display port may not even be included. You might actually have to have a dongle for that as well. Now, where this really is starting to shine, though, is the move towards USB-C, and more specifically, Thunderbolt, which is run over a USB-C connection. So a USB-C and Thunderbolt are not mutually exclusive, but Thunderbolt can run over USB-C. Uh, and the cool thing about Thunderbolt is it can have up to 40 gigabytes of data on it and allows you to do something like run dual 4K monitors at the same time. Really powerful stuff. Thunderbolt is the future. Um, I would highly recommend getting a machine with a Thunderbolt port um, so you have future proofing built in. Now, the key thing about Thunderbolt, though, is there are two options. There's two lane and four lane. A four lane has a full 40 gigabits. Two lanes has 20 gigabits. And this kind of will limit you with two gig, sorry, a, a two lane Thunderbolt will only capable of driving a single 4K monitor. <laughs> I can't believe I'm using only, but that's kind of the state of things. So if you really want to take advantage of Thunderbolt, you want a four channel. Now, actually finding out if it's got two lanes or four lanes is uh, it's not the easiest thing in the world. All right, so next what we're gonna do is actually go through some of the machines I found that fit my actual criteria um, that I've already labeled out, and hopefully some of these will be useful to you. Again, I have uh, links to all of these down below, um, and pretty much I try to stay on Amazon for all of them, um, so you get you know apples to apples price comparison. And also keep in mind, I'm using uh, US um, sources for all of these as I, even when I can help it, just trying to keep the dollar consistent across um, for all of you users. But basically we're gonna go through in no particular order a lot of the machines that fit this particular criteria and we'll start off with oop, oop. yep here we go alienware now personal opinion i don't like alienware i think they're bulky i think they're crappy i think they barely barely fit the criteria of this list they got middling battery life but at the same time they also generally have quite a bit of power built in and if you get an alien wheel 13 it's portable ish and the nice thing is anyone tries to mug you you can smack them with this laptop and you're off the races but at the same time a lot of game studios build around their alienware so, so you know this is definitely a machine that has a following i'm not part of that following just thought i would include it for a completion and this is kind of dell's line now what i don't like about alienware is i got a sneaking suspicion that the existence of alienware is why the xps 15 my next suggestion is not better than it is. Now the XPS 15 is a great laptop. It has one of the most beautiful screens on the market. It's got a nice form factor. It's got good battery life. It's got great specs available. It's just a great machine with an okay graphics processor. As of right now, the best you can get is a 1050. And I think again, it's that Alienware um, heritage that they're trying to not split their market. And I really hope they move away from this. Now, if you're somewhere in between these two for pricing, both of these are pretty pricey machines. The Alienware are quite pricey. The uh, XPS 15 still starts at 14. And by the time you get a GPU in there, uh, we're probably looking more towards the two grand mark. So we're definitely not talking cheap machines yet. So if your budget's a little bit lower, what you might want to check out actually is the Inspiron 15 7000. This is again a GTX 1050 GPU, um, but 
It's a little bit bigger than the XPS, a little bit bigger bezels, slightly less quality screen, better ventilation, some styling that is kind of love it or hate it. Personally, I'm not a huge fan to be honest, but it's also quite a bit cheaper. And every single model has that GeForce uh, graphics in it. It's not a huge upgrade on the other side. So if you want to stick with the Dell family, in my experience, our Dell are actually quite well built. And you have good size support behind it. Dell is a huge company. Uh, so you're going to be able to swap out the batteries, etc. Another thing is I think all three of these have Thunderbolt in some form available on them. All right, so next we're gonna switch out manufacturers and we're heading over to, oh, I always screw this up. Is this Acer or Asus? Acer, yeah, the Acer Predator line. Um, this machine is, well, to be honest, it's quite heavy. We're actually pushing towards that six, six pound limit. It's, yeah, it's a little big in my world. And another thing I personally don't like about it is I don't like this, styling. I don't like game laptop styling, to be honest. I don't want glowy bits on my machine or dragon flames to be spraying up the back. Or, But at the flip side, you do get solid ventilation, a machine that you can really push. And these guys have an advertised seven hours of battery life, which is where a lot of these machines fall on their face. Good SSD and CPU options and a 1060 GPU. So it could be a pretty solid choice for you. And the pricing isn't bad. Another option, if you want to stay a little bit more on the uh, conventional side is they have the Acer V Nitro, the Nitro Black specifically. Um, it's got a 1060 GPU, weighs in at 5.5 pounds, six hours to the battery life. Again, it's a little bit bigger, but it's also a little bit cheaper and a little bit more sedated in its styling, which again, I'm, I kind of lean towards, but if you don't care, well, you don't care. That's one of those things that is no longer an issue for you. Um, next up, we're moving over to Asus. Now, Asus has a ton of laptops available, and if you don't care about weight, they've probably got something great for you. And basically, the Republic of Gamers line makes all kinds of GPU-enabled laptops from, like, they even have one that's nine grand with a curved 23-inch screen. It's absolutely insane. What we're looking at today is the Zephyrus. Now, the Zephyrus is um, a 1080-powered laptop that is... Um, 0.7 inches thick, 4.9 pounds, and outrageously expensive. Um, so those are your trade-offs. And the cool thing about Zephyrus is it's one of the first um, GeForce, uh, what are they called, GMAX? Oh, no, it's not, Max-Q. And basically, Max-Q is a standard basically set by um, NVIDIA in its a combination of hardware settings and uh, software settings that keep the laptop they basically underclock that 1080 so that it works in a cooling factor that does the fans aren't always running so it's designed to be a little bit more stealth and it's a pretty machine it's not um it's not glaringly gamey you've got this one logo on here you can get that in stainless steel i believe you can turn that backlighting off um so otherwise it's quite a pretty looking cool looking laptop with an outrageous price tag outrageous hardware in it now the thing about that max q that you should be aware of while this is a 1080 max q actually brings it down slower because it's clocked down to save battery power um, heat thermals fans etc uh, so it's more in between a 1070 and a 1080 in performance they've also got a 1070 version i believe which again is um, a max q 1070 is more in between a 1060 and a 1070 for performance it's one of those things to be aware of now another option we've got from a bit more of the traditional um on the Asus side is their Strix line. Now, nowhere near as nice, but also nowhere near as expensive. And you can get upwards to, or up to a 1070 GPU. It's slightly over an inch thick, but still only weighs 4.8 pounds. So it's still quite portable, a good mix between balance power and cost. Now, the um, the battery comes in in reviews somewhere around the four hour mark, which actually for game laptops is still pretty reasonable. Now, next up we go to uh, my last choice is, uh, Razer. So actually, it was before the Gigabit, I bought a Razer. Razer Blade uh, 14, they call them now. I bought the original one back when it came out. And the part that I'm a little bit disappointed by is, well, Razer products have always been expensive. It's just part of the brand. But they were really the first one to bring out a capable machine in a small form factor. And they've kind of been resting on their laurels. The current Razer is almost identical on the outside to the one that I bought four years ago. Uh, and that's a little disappointing, especially when you're talking a $2,200 plus machine. Now uh, the hardware inside, it's a 1060, but they are incredibly well built. Now the catch here is though, Razer's support is 
yeah, they're kind of a boutique company and you kind of get boutique sport. Um, so you got to ship it off to California if you need it fixed, which was kind of a disappointment. But on the other hand, uh, again, 1060 GPU, Thunderbolt built in. Um, and another option we've got here is the Razer uh, Blade Stealth. Now this we'll get back to later on. And do be aware, Razer Blade Stealth is not a gaming laptop. It is an ultrabook and it does not have a dedicated GPU. So why is that of importance? Well, again, we will get back to that shortly. So next up we have Gigabyte. And in all honesty, uh, my last laptop was a Gigabyte. Uh, the build quality was okay. It's lasted, it still works for me actually. Um, I'll be turning it into my uh, dedicated secondary machine. It's it's been a great machine. And if I was to buy any other laptop than the one that I did, spoiler alert, I would have bought the Aero 15X. This machine is awesome. Um, it's got a GTX 1070. It is small, it is lightweight. Um, it is reasonably priced, still not by any definition of the word cheap, but for about two grand, you get huh, a great machine. So it's got a uh, 1070 Max-Q, so that's somewhere between a 1060 and a 1070 in size. Large SSD, lots of RAM, 16 gigs, I think up to 32 is a possibility, four and a half pounds. The coolest thing is they put a large battery in there. So they're claiming upwards to, uh, I believe it's seven hours uh, of battery life on this thing, maybe even more. So um, you can, basically run this thing all day. On top of that, uh, it does have Thunderbolt, 40, uh, 40 gigabyte Thunderbolt. It's got all the ports you want. The biggest problem I found with this guy is I can't buy it anywhere. Uh, so that was actually a bit of an issue. Uh, but once this thing starts being in stock, it's definitely one to consider. Now, if the Aero 15X is too rich for your blood, there is the older Aero 15, same thing minus the Max-Q. And then on top of that, there is the predecessor to my last machine, which is the P56 uh, XT, again a 1070 machine. It's a little bit bigger, a little bit cheaper, uh, not max Q, uh, but still a rock solid machine. And uh, yeah, I was really satisfied with mine. So I, I imagine they're the same thing. Now the nice thing with the um, the 15X is it actually uses the same display as a Dell uh, XPS, that zero bezel line. So it's a beautiful screen. Uh, the P56 uh, has a slightly less nice screen, but still a very potent and powerful machine. Now, it was mine was a little bit plasticky. I had one of the screws fall out of it. Um, so, you know, the build quality is exceptional, but another nice thing about Gigabyte is they actually have a two-year warranty. And I used mine, and it was done through a service outlet. Um, so, uh, you know, unlike Razer, you don't have to ship it halfway across the country. And two years is an anomaly. Most of these machines have only a one-year warranty. Um, so that's definitely in Gigabyte's favor. Now this next one is shocking. I never really thought this would make any kind of a gaming list. And that is the Microsoft Surface Book 2. Now this was somewhat recently announced and first off, it is outrageously expensive. They took Max model for pricing and ran with it. Uh, you're looking at about three grand to start for a good GPU powered one, but that is the key thing. This is a GPU powered machine. It's actually a tablet detaches from the base. The base itself has a GeForce 1050 GPU in it. Um, they advertise a staggering 10 plus hours of uh, battery life, VR capable graphics, um, you name it. It's it, uh, one of the favorite machines among graphic designers. Got a great touch screen, um, great pen support, a beautiful, beautiful screen, very well made but for a huge price. Now on top of that, there is something that came up with it that was just disqualifying for me. Actually two things. First off, no Thunderbolt and that kind of sucks. So the expandability just isn't there. Second, probably the biggest deal is apparently there's an issue with it when it's running and doing things like say gaming or running a game engine, you know, the kind of stuff that, you know, game developers do, apparently the battery drains and that's not cool. So while you're using it plugged in, the battery is constantly draining and Microsoft have acknowledged this problem, but I don't think they've actually ever said that they're going to fix it. So yeah, that's not the greatest. Um, but after Microsoft, we move on to MSI. Now MSI is going to get a bit of an exception here because I'm not going to go to the individual models. I highlighted two of them out in the guide below, but truth of the matter is MSI just makes so many laptops. Um, they have as you can see over here to the side, the GT, the GS, the GE, the GP, the GL, and GV series. And within each one of those, there are, so here you can see there's four different versions of the VR. Um, they've got the Raider, the Apache, the uh, Ghost, the Stealth, the blah, blah, blah. They keep going. But you are going to find, if you look through the MSI lineup of machines, they have a machine for every criteria. They have a lot of smaller form factor machines, things that are well under the five pound mark, 
Uh, they have machines capable of up to 1070, a lot of VR-ready machines with just absolutely loaded specs. You name it. Probably where you're going to end up looking is about the GE line. That's about where the sweet spot is for price versus performance versus portability, etc. But do check out their whole line. Now, I don't have a lot of experience with MSI, but what I do know is across almost all of them, and the disqualifying thing from my perspective is battery life stinks. You're looking at two hours, three hours at best on their best machines. So uh, almost every review I read about every single MSI machine, just it came back having pretty much a bad battery, which is kind of unfortunate. Now this next one is going to be kind of controversial and I personally am not going down that road, but I'd be uh, negligent in the extreme if I didn't mention it. And that's a MacBook, um, especially the MacBook Pro. Now the catch here is we're going back to the Surface Book kind of thing here. MacBook pricing is insane. You're looking at, for a GPU powered MacBook, about three grand, and the GPU in it sucks. Uh, they use AMD GPUs. I believe the most recent one is a 555 Radeon, which is about equivalent of a GTX 1050. So the very best you can get from the Mac side of things is a GTX 1050. <sighs> and you're paying through the wazoo. Now let's go to the flip side. A MacBook has some of the best build quality in the industry, one of the best lasting batteries. You're looking at nine or 10 hours potentially of usage, uh, rock solid build quality. It's one of the best selling laptops for a very good reason other than status. Um, unfortunately, they've also made some decisions that I haven't been a fan of um, beyond putting terrible GPUs in their machine. And the biggest one is they got rid of their FRO keys and they replaced it with a light bar. And I hate it. I would never buy this machine specifically because of that. And I know a lot of people basically in the same boot. But at the same time, you can, um, using boot camp, run Windows and Mac OS on your machine. So it's one of the most versatile machines you've got out there. And if you want to do um, iOS or Mac OS builds, you require a Mac in this day and age. So there is an appeal to MacBook as well. Just expect to pay a lot for it, to be infuriated by the FRO key, and to have a crap GPU for a heavy price tag. So now we move on to Lenovo. Now, Lenovo has a couple of options here. First off, we have the Yoga 720, kind of unique in this list. It's a bit like the Surface Book, but half of the price and it doesn't separate. So basically what you can do is you can flip it over, fold it in half and use it like a tablet, a giant 15 inch tablet, but like a tablet. And the screen is almost zero bezel line. So it is a lot like the XPS in form factor, uh, really well made machine, beautiful specs. Now the cool thing about this guy is, well, first off 1300 bucks. Second off, it has a 1050 uh, GPU in it and a Thunderbolt port, which is only two channels, unfortunately, but um, pretty good combinations of specs going on there. Now, if you don't care about the two-in-one aspect of it, you don't want that drawing, there's the slightly less attractive, in my humble opinion, uh, but the Lenovo Legion Y720, and this is basically a um, non-tablet version of the same thing. Again, a 1050 uh, um, GeForce CP, uh, GPU in there, uh, capable machine, good specs, and uh, again, higher price, but, oh, sorry, this is a 1060, so actually a better GPU in there, uh, but not touch or not tablet format, not flippable or two-in-one. Um, so either you like that or you don't. So you've kind of got the two options here. And the nice thing about both those laptops is they both have rock solid batteries. The um, Lenovo was rated at something like seven or eight hours. Very impressive that way. And then uh, we've also got from Lenovo, a little bit outside of where I was going with this, but if you look through their ThinkPad lines, a handful of them also have um, GPU options that fit the requirements. But some of those also have ThinkPad price tags, which can be quite um, high. Uh, and then the other one I would normally mention, but currently the lineup sucks, is HP. HP has their um, Spectre line, which is a two-in-one like that one, and HP Spectre X360 is the first one that was announced that has this new Intel slash Radeon chipset, which again is about equivalent to a 1060, uh, well advertising at seven or eight hour battery life. So when that machine comes to market, they have a great possibility. The current Spectre has a 940, um, GeForce 940M GPU, which is barely usable in my opinion. So uh, that's why it's not currently on the list. No, normally they've also got their line of HP Omen with some really nice machines, but currently they need a refresh. Nothing there that I would currently recommend, but HP is one to keep an eye on because their refresh products could be great. And normally their build quality is pretty solid and their options are pretty solid. And there's one final thing we can discuss 
And this goes back to what I mentioned earlier on about the razor blade stealth. Now the razor blade stealth is an ultra bar. And I keep harping on about this whole Thunderbolt thing too. If you get a Thunderbolt 4 and a solid spec ultra bar, and what I mean by that is you want to have probably a quad core, 16 gigs of RAM, and all the storage you need with a Thunderbolt 4 cable. What you could go about then is this option, which is an external GPU. Now, the one we're looking at right here is the Razer Core. And the whole idea behind the Razer Stealth was you could pair it with the Razer Core. You use the Razer Stealth as an Ultrabook out through the day. You get your 10 hours of battery life using your, you know, integrated Intel GPU while you're out. But if you need to have more power, you hook it up to the Core, which then you plug in a GPU to, and you've got desktop-like performance, but it's powered off the guts of your laptop. And you kind of get a best of both worlds thing. The problem there is, is again, hey, what, hi, Razer. Outrageously expensive. The core is something like four or five hundred dollars. Oh, six hundred fifty dollars Canadian. So probably five hundred US or four ninety nine US. And it's just a cold an enclosure. You still have to add your your graphics card on top of that. So you need another seven hundred dollars for a GTX ten eighty or a ten seventy on top of that. You're looking at twelve or thirteen hundred bucks. And when you're starting to get this kind of price tag, it's like, well, why don't I just buy a desktop? Which kind of is a pretty good argument. Why don't you? Now, arguably, there's arguments for keeping the laptop. Obviously, if you have a laptop, when you plug it there, all your data is on it. When you walk away, all your data is still on it. So basically, you're plunking it down and just giving it more power. And that's advantageous over a desktop. You can't easily just pick up and move the data that's on your desktop. Um, so again, there is an advantage to, to pairing an Ultrabook to one of these cores. And at the same time, this can also be powered by various different other... Um, Ultrabooks out on the market. If you get a good quad core Thunderbolt enabled uh, machine, you could use an XPS 13, for example, or a uh, HP Spectre, like I mentioned earlier, uh, to power one of these external GPUs. Or another option for the GPU side of things is the Aorus Game Box. And this is a much better buy. For one, it is a lot smaller. This is the size of a toaster. And what this is basically is a stripped down 1070 or a 1080 in an enclosure. And what they've done is basically marked it up by about a hundred bucks. So I think this thing is seven or eight hundred dollars US, and that includes a 1070 or a 1080 card inside. So it's pretty much the cost of a gigabyte Aorus. 1070 or 1080 card plus about $100 for the enclosure and that's a much much more reasonable deal So in fact spoiler alert, this is actually what I bought I have a Aorus 1080 box coupled so when I'm at home and I need full-on power I've got that and then I got the Lenovo Yoga 720 as my daily driver So basically when I'm out and about I've got a 1080 no, sorry the 1050 GPU Which is generally way more than enough to do you know most of what I need uh, I get seven hours battery life while I'm out and about, nice 4K display, but when I bring it home and I need to do uh, VR, for example, or you know, I just wanna just power through something or I need to do you know, a high rendering scene, I hook it up to the external GPU and I'm off to the races. Now, one thing to be aware about with that combination is it is a dual channel Thunderbolt on the Yoga 720, so um, I can only power an external monitor. Powering it back to this, the internal display doesn't work so great because I'm starting to run out of channel at that point, or I couldn't run two, two monitors. One of those things to be aware of if you go the same road I did. But basically, I'm fine with just running a single external monitor off of that GPU, and then I use the other GPU to run the internal monitor, and it works out pretty well for me. And uh, I have no complaints with this setup. I'll probably actually do a review of the Aorus box and the Lenovo Y720 at some point in the future. So if this is a combination that is interesting to you, do stay tuned. And really that is what we are covering today. That That's um, pretty much the lineup of the laptops that are out there that I find most suitable for game development. Now again, your needs may be much smaller you may not need, you know, may not care about VR, may not care about VR in the future. In that case, that 1060 requirement isn't such a big requirement for you. Um, and you can save a ton of money there by going to a, a slightly slower machine. You may not care about portability. If you don't care about portability or battery life, then you can basically ignore this. Let's go out there and buy any 17-inch um, uber fast 1070 power zero battery life laptop out there for, you know, 900 bucks. And you're probably good to go. Just be aware it's more of a desktop replacement than an actual laptop, at least in my humble opinion. Hopefully some of this was useful to you. That's all we're going to really cover for today. I hope it was. If it was, please do click that like button. Of course, and we cover all kinds of game development related topics here, including apparently uh, game development laptops. Uh, if you do find that interesting, uh, please do hit that subscribe button. All right. I'll talk to you all later. Goodbye.